morning, everyone. So this is Joseph. He's got a rather interesting gear here, and it's going to work, too. I know that. <laughs> With that, it's Joseph. Hi, guys. Uh, so thank you for joining to, to this talk. Uh, I really hope that you, you guys will enjoy it. So um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, this research and how I broke uh, this Wing OS. Uh, what I'm going to do is to, to discuss uh, about some interaction about this uh, Wing OS thing is. Then we'll discuss some scenarios and attack surface that we have uh, with uh, this OS and, and the devices. Then uh, I will describe with uh, full technical details uh, some critical vulnerabilities. And then I'll try to, to make a, a, a demo with uh, these two devices with an exploit that uh, I did for uh, trying to exploit one of the vulnerabilities. And then after that, we will discuss some conclusions. So um, what the hell is this Wing OS? Uh, so basically, it's uh, an embedded Linux operating system um, with its own proprietary stuff in, in the kernel, like they have their own proprietary drivers, they have their own proprietary socket address family and stuff like that. So originally it was created by Motorola, but now it's property of uh, Extreme Networks. Uh, we'll discuss about it in a couple of minutes. Then the, uh, the architecture is MIPS N32. At least uh, the devices that I've been working with during this research were MIPS N32. And mainly it's used uh, for wireless access points and wireless controllers. And as far as I know, there is no public information or previous research on um, and reported vulnerabilities about uh, this uh, OS, as far as I know, at least. So from Extreme Network's uh, website, um, we can get some high-level details about this OS. Like, for instance, here it's saying that it's for WLAN architectures and it's designed for to scale efficiently from the smallest networks to large geographically dispersed uh, deployments and stuff like that. So from the website, you can get more or less uh, an idea and high level details of this OS. So we have a, a web interface, a typical web interface where we can set uh, a lot of stuff. I mean, the web interface is, is huge. Um, and it also has uh, vulnerabilities, but I didn't want to focus this research about web uh, vulnerabilities, so we, will, we won't discuss web vulnerabilities in, during this talk. But also we have uh, the typical command line interface similar to the Cisco IOS where you can, I mean, you have like different type of commands and combinations of commands where you can set uh, the device. And this command line interface uh, is uh, restricted, meaning that uh, from here you can't access to the uh, operating system, the Linux operating system that it's running in, in the background. So devices using this Wing OS, so uh, I, I didn't get an official list of devices affected, but based on public information, for instance, from Extreme Networks website, we can see a list of Win access points and controllers that uses this operating system. But as this is not official, this list could be even bigger in the case of Extreme Networks. But also we have uh, Motorola devices and Zebra devices because, um, as I said, Motorola uh, created this OS, so they have uh, also their devices uh, with this OS. And then Zebra bought this part of the business to, from Motorola, and that's why we, we, we also have uh, Zebra devices with this OS. And then at the end, Extreme Networks bought this part of the, the business from Zebra. So basically, that's why we have Motorola access points, Motorola controllers, Zebra devices, and Extreme Networks devices running with this uh, uh, running this uh, operating system. And also we got the uh, control device. So uh, this particular one is important because uh, all this research started because of this. Um, this, uh, well, Contron is a company that uh, makes embedded devices for different industries, such as the aircraft industry and the train industry and stuff like that. So one of my coworkers in IOactive, Ruben Santa Marta, said, hey guys, here is an interesting target. Uh, uh, this is an access point that is widely used in aircraft in, by many airlines around the world. So this could be uh, an interesting target for our research project. And then I thought, yeah, this might be fun. 
and yeah, it ended up being pretty fun. So um, basically, this is a box that it has some special connectors to to comply with the aircraft um, regulations, the aircraft industry regulations. But bas basically, inside we got that Motorola AP7131 access point. So where we can find these devices? As we can see for instance in this uh, picture from the internet uh, from an aircraft, uh, they are actually uh, installing the Motorola, that Motorola access point uh, at the ceiling of the aircraft. So uh, as I was saying, uh, it's widely used in, in aircraft by many airlines around the world. We got some other pictures uh, from the internet where we can see the, the control box where inside it's that uh, Motorola, particular Motorola access point. And yeah, it, it appears that uh, they are installing the, these access points at the ceiling of, of the aircraft, but I don't know if in maybe in other types of aircrafts they are installing the, uh, the access point in other places. I have no idea. So from the Extreme Networks website and some case studies uh, that we can find uh, on in the internet, we can see that these devices are also used in other different scenarios and industries such as smart buildings, smart cities, healthcare, government, uh, obviously small and big enterprises networks, I don't know, in a lot of different scenarios. Let's see some examples quickly. Um, this is for instance a Motorola case study where uh, we can see that the AP7161 and this, uh, the 9500 controller are used in more than 200 subway stations in the New York City subway to provide Wi-Fi uh, to, to the passengers. Then also we got container ports, uh, global, el global electronics manufacturers such as Isola in this case and different facilities, universities such as this one. Uh, also even in mines, this, this case study from Zebra uh, explains how uh, these devices are used in the Westmoreland coal company in mines. I don't know, uh, Saigon City in Vietnam where they have more than 1500 access points installed to provide Wi-Fi. Uh, casinos, uh, resorts, Nanjing University in China, another example, hospitals, uh, MWR facilities, case study, even apparently in military bases, uh, as we can see in this case uh, study. So as you can see in a lot of different uh, scenarios uh, and industries. So for the attack surface and scenarios, I divided two and this is mainly because the, the aircraft scenario is a little bit different and it has uh, some particularities and the other scenario it's basically the rest of the scenarios that we got. So uh, all of this stuff is focusing the remote pre-authenticated vulnerabilities that I found and the, the vulnerabilities that we will discuss uh, later. So first we have the, e, the attack surface of the ethernet cable, meaning like if the attacker has physical access to the access point, he can just connect the, the cable to the, to the device, to any port or uh, to, uh, to an uh, administrative uh, port. Um, and then he could, if he can reach the vulnerable UDP service and mean services, then uh, technically the, the attacker could exploit the, the issues. Of course, in the case of the aircraft, uh, this is less likely, right, because if the, the access point is at the ceiling, I don't know, I, I think that's un unlikely. But I don't know, still it's a, a possibility. But also these vulnerabilities are te te technically possible to exploit over the air through the Wi-Fi connection. And also in the aircraft scenario we got another um, um, attack surface which is pivoting from the satellite modem to the access point from the ground. Let me explain this a little bit. So I don't know if, if you guys are familiar with uh, my co-workers Ruben Santa Marta research. Uh, he recently spoke about this in, in Black Hat, in the last call for SATCOM security. So basically he was able uh, from the internet, just using a regular, regular internet connection, nothing special, to hack and compromise satellite modems of aircrafts that are running, that are actually flying on the air. So then based on that we, we saw that uh, based on some information that we saw on, on the internet that the attacker should be able to reach from the satellite modem the, uh, the access point which is running the wing OS. So this could be another um, attack surface. 
And of course, uh, I must say that uh, the safety of the aircraft in these uh, attacks and, and stuff in, for the wing OS and everything, the safety of the aircraft is not uh, at, risk, uh, at risk. It's only um, the communications. So this is one of the architectures and this is the satellite model that uh, Ruben uh, compromised and this is the access point running the wing OS and these are connected through the SMU server so we are uh, pretty sure that uh, it should be possible to reach the access point from the satellite modem and exploit the wing OS uh, vulnerabilities. Then the other scenarios basically are the rest like uh, outdoor access points or indoor access points. So again the other attack surface is again if the attacker has physical access to the access point just connect the ethernet cable and, and that's it and this is more likely in, in outdoor access points but also possible in indoor access points if the attacker is inside of the office or the building or, or whatever. But again through the Wi-Fi it's also technically possible as we will see in the demo to exploit uh, some of these issues. And also if, if the attacker is somehow in, inside the internal network uh, and if, if the attacker has connectivity to some of these devices then uh, obviously he can, he could try to exploit the, the issues. So let's start with the vulnerabilities. Um, the first one is not a really critical one but it was a really important one for the research because it's a hidden a root cell kind of uh, backdoor. So uh, and yeah um, when, um, when you get a root cell the process of the research it makes easier the, this process I mean the research. So uh, but it's a kind of for it's a kind of privileged escalation vulnerability. Uh, because uh, you need access to this uh, command line interface to get that root shell. So from the attacker's perspective, yeah, if the attacker somehow has access to the command line interface, it's good. He can do a lot of stuff. But um, if, if the attacker good, uh, gets a root shell, then we can say that the, the device is completely uh, compromised. So here we can see and this picture um, some, in some forum, some, some guys asking about this service star shell command that gets you into the native operating system but he says that Motorola may not disclose the required password to mere customers. So I was trying to find information about this uh, star shell command. So all, all I got was like forums like that people asking about it but that's, that's all I got. Even if, if we read the Wing OS manual we can see that yes there we have a star shell command which provides cell access but that's all, all you get. So when you execute this command you get this um, like last password used password with this MAC address and then this password prompt asking to the user to, to type the password. So one of you guys might think here like okay so it's telling me what, what is the last password used so I'm gonna try password in lowercase letters but um, obviously it's not gonna work here. So uh, then since we, we got access to the firmware uh, image then we are going to start to uh, statically reverse engineer some, some binaries to find out how this works. So based on the strings we can see here the last password used string and then uh, here is going to call this validate map uh, password function and depending on the return value it's going to um, reach this basic block where it's going to get the, uh, the root shell. So let's in get inside this validate map uh, password function. Then again it's gonna call this another one get last map uh, password function where it's gonna open this file etc2 I miss password file and the content of the file uh, this file is this particular string and this is the default value in every wing OS this uh, string in inside that file. Then after that with the content of the file it's going to execute these uh, instructions in this loop. So to, to play around with Unicorn I emulated this code. Uh, I don't know if you guys know or are familiar with Unicorn but it's an also framework that uses uh, Kimo in the background and allows you to, to emulate several uh, architectures. But of course uh, in order to emulate the code you need some previous reverse engineering uh, job or work. Uh, for instance here you need to, to know uh, what register points to, to your input, the buffer where we have the, the contents of that, of that file and also you need to know the, 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 the register that points to the buffer where we will have the result of the operations. 
So uh, I was using the Python API for um, Unicorn and it's pretty simple so you can emulate the instructions and provide the register values and create your buffer and inside that buffer we have the content of uh, that file. And then after the execution of the emulation we are printing out here the um, the buffer where we have the result which is these bytes, the result. So if we look at it carefully we can see that this was the, the string that we had inside the file. So when the code is reading uh, each ASCII character then we got each uh, hex byte for each ASCII character. And after that um, this is the result that we got after those uh, operations in that loop. So if we can see that these bytes are these guys here. So basically it's meaning that this is hex. Then after that it's going to call a RC4 decryption routine. Uh it's going to try to decrypt the um the content of uh the file, I mean the the hex bytes after uh, those operations in the loop with this static key. Hi Sabina, how are you doing? Bye. Ah no, nice key. And and yeah, so in this case uh, after the decryption the result is going to be uh, the password uh, string in lowercase letter which makes sense because we were in the get last password and that's why it was printing out here like last password use password in lowercase letters. Then after that uh, the code is going to get the, the MAC address of the device and then with the MAC address it's going to uh, execute these other instructions in this loop but and basically it's uh, doing some operations with the MAC like adding some numbers to each byte of the Mac. Like here the first byte is adding zero, then the second byte is adding one, and then two, three, four, and so on. And um, and yeah, and then uh, after that what it's going to do is call another RC4 decryption routine. So it's going to decrypt password, so the uh, which uh, is the result for the last RC4 decryption. But now it's with this key, the, the MAC address with those operations that we were talking about. And finally, after that, it's going to execute these other instructions, which uh, I also emulated to, to play around with Unicorn. But basically, these instructions are making sure that the, the, um, the result is only lowercase letters. So here is the emulation, as you can see, and in, in my device, uh, for my MAC address, this is the valid password, which is only lowercase uh, letters, and then you can finally access to to the root cell. Then, in the code, we can see that after the password is granted, it's gonna open again that file, the IMIS password file, and then it's gonna um, RC4 encrypt with the same key, the Hi Sabina, how you doing uh, key, the password that the user typed when the password was granted. Meaning that the next time you you're gonna execute the service uh, star shell command, the password is gonna be different. That's why I call this like a, a kind of a dynamic password because uh, uh, the next time it's, it's gonna be the same, and you will have to do the whole thing to to calculate the password. So here you have uh, the the overall process in case you later want to to check uh, with the slides. And yeah, and finally, uh, in the code, also we can see that uh, since we got access to the root cell, then creating this file, a low root in etc, uh, then you can make it persistent. And then uh, all the time that you execute the command, it's not going to ask for any password again. Okay. So now, uh, since now we have a uh, root cell, we can start to, to try to, to see more stuff about this OS. For instance, to check um, what services are running by default. And for instance, we can see that there are several ports like this uh, 3799 UDP port, which is listening over all the IP addresses. So in this case, it's the RIM process, the radio interface module. So um, we are going to see a remote pre authenticated stack overflow of this service. But this particular one only affects older versions of the firmware. But I wanted to share uh, with you guys this one. Uh, because uh, it seems that they tried to fix it, but they made another mistake as, you, as we will see shortly. But yeah, so now from here is the typical stuff from uh, uh, protocol reverse engineering. So basically we trace the sockets and um, we know where the code is uh, parsing the user's buffer. So in this case, uh, in this break before we, we know that the, the buffer length is uh, 1000 hex, which is um, pretty big. 
and then just reading the code and following how the code is uh, parsing the, the user's buffer, uh, we can see that uh, there is one particular MemCPY where the source and the size are completely controlled by the user and the destination is a, a stack buffer. So it's a typical stack buffer of flow. So <clears throat> we, we are here. Uh, here's where we have in this red block uh, the rugby from and here's where we have the, the, the call of, uh, to this function where inside we have that particular vulnerable main CPY. So what we need to know to do right now is the typical reverse engineering stuff, like to find out how to get from here to there, uh, just reading the code and, and build your own Python client uh, to reach that particular main CPY. So this is uh, one of the, the Python uh, client to, to reach that stack overflow. So uh, as I said, this only affects old versions of the firmware, but based on information that I got from the Contron website, the Contron devices that are using aircrafts, uh, apparently some of them could be vulnerable as, as I saw in the website that the, um, they were running older versions of the, of the firmware. So apparently they tried to fix this, this stack overflow. Uh, so here in, in newer uh, versions of the firmware, so we can see here that they are checking the, the size of the, the main CPY, which is user control. But if it's bigger than this value, then it's not going to reach that uh, vulnerable main CPY. Instead, it's, it's going to execute this assert print function that is going to uh, generate this crash dump and then it's going to kill the, the process. So yeah, this is a Python code to, to reach that. And so yeah, you can kill the process, but the process uh, it will uh, restart immediately. But the problem here is that there is a watchdog in this system that checks if this process is alive because this process apparently is critical for the operating system. So if you execute this Python script like two or three times in a row, then the watchdog is going to check that the, um, the the RIM process is not alive, and then the whole operating system is going to be reboot. That's why I call this like uh, global denial of service. Then let's move on to, to the main vulnerabilities. I mean, there are other EDP services with, with issues, but uh, we don't have time to, to talk about them. So let's move on to, to the main uh, issues. So when I was reverse engineering some of the binaries, then I realized that they were receiving data from, uh, from some particular sockets. So when tracing these sockets, I realized that they were using non-standard values, such for instance the 32x value for the domain value, and some references such as this one, like local mint address. So I wanted to to know what the hell was this mint thing. So there's no much information in, on the internet about this mint thing, at, at least about how it works uh, internally. The, of course, obviously there are information about how to set the devices to, to work with Mint and stuff like that. But yeah, basically it's a layer two, layer three proprietary protocol originally also created by Motorola. And they have like two levels, level one for VLAN and level two for IP. So Mint is used uh, mainly to, to communicate devices between them. So for instance, here we have uh, these access points communicating between them through level one mint, or this access point to this uh, controller through level two mint, or these two controllers through level two mint as well. So yeah, when, when you trace some of the processes as well, you can see some stuff like the, the socket address family, which is non-standard, AF mint, the port, and then the mint address, which is the four last bytes of the MAC address. So yeah, they, they, they created their own proprietary socket address family in their kernel, the AF mint, and uh, in my case at least I was uh, using datagram sockets. So the goal here is to, to be able to create a client so we can communicate uh, with other devices, other devices using, using mint. So we have three options here. It's like the first one, reverse engineer their kernel and try to, to make your own client and make it work in your Linux box, which is technically possible. Then another option could be to try to emulate the whole operating system on the kernel and, and then make your own uh, mint client, which is also technically possible, but it could be a pain in the ass. And then the quickest one, which is the one I took because I, I didn't want to spend too much time working on that. So find a way to build a client using their, their kernel. So basically what I'm doing is uh, using advice uh, as the attacker. 
So I'm running my own Mint client in the operating system. But but again, this is not the only option. I mean, uh, an, an attacker could uh, get, use the option one or option two and use its own Mint client in, in its uh, Linux box or whatever. So attack scenarios using Mint. So yeah, if the in my, in my case, as I'm using a device as the attacker, then if the attacker connects its device to the network uh, with a, I mean, physically with the cable or through the Wi-Fi, then if if he's able to reach uh, other access points or controllers uh, that are uh, using Mint, then he can exploit the vulnerability. And of course, other scenario could be that the attacker remotely compromises uh, one device and then. Uh, since he has access to the root cell, then uh, exploit the main issues to other uh, devices that are con connected with. And then, yes, uh, basically uh, attack the main services that are running in access points and controllers. Controllers are also interesting because they are like kind of Windows domain controller, meaning that uh, um, controllers can have like uh, hundreds of access points connected. So if the attacker co uh, compromised one controller, then he could uh, compromise hundreds of uh, access points. And not only uh, with the vulnerabilities, but also controllers has the ability to uh, change the configuration remotely of the access points and also even update the firmware of, of the access points remotely. So uh, the way I created the main client in, in the OS, uh, so uh, we have here in the OS a um, modified Python interpreter, and they have also their own libraries, such as this one for sockets, and this allows us to, through Python, to create AFMint uh, sockets. So they have some Pyth Python compiled files in the operating system, and then reverse engineering those uh, compiled files. I saw how to create my own uh, Python client uh, to communicate, communicate through, through Mint. So basically here's the Mint address, which is in decimal, but is the four last bytes of the MAC address of the target, then the port, the buffer, and then you can create the AF Mint socket and then send data through, through Mint to the, to the target. Uh, so one, one important thing about Mint is that we can expect to, to have Mint where in the scenarios where we have several access points and controllers because as I said, Mint is used to communicate communications between devices. But also I, I wanted to check if standalone access points can also uh, use Mint. So yes, technically as I, as I saw during the, the, my test and the, during the research, um, it's possible. As we can see here, the, the Mint in a standalone access point is uh, enabled by default because you can um, set uh, standalone ac uh, access points as uh, virtual controllers, for instance. So the attacker, what only needs to, to exploit these issues uh, is to know the IP address of the target. I mean, there is no any kind of authentication. So this is the target, my, the attacker's device, this uh, Motorola Black Access Point. Um, so we only need to like to set controller host and the IP address, and then the mint link is uh, established. But this is not the only way to establish a mint link. Uh, as far as I know, there are other other ways. For instance, also if you connect uh, an access point in, in in the network, then the other access points could detect in a, in an automatic way this new access point and establish the mint link in an automatic way. And probably there are more more ways because I'm not uh, an expert with this mint uh, thing. So yeah, so after that, in the attacker's device, we can see that uh, with the show mint neighbors, we can see that the, the mint link is already established. So now we can com communicate through mint. So now we just need to, to yet to find bugs in, in mint services. So there are a lot of binaries and a lot of mint services uh, receiving data from, from sockets. So this example is, is from the HSD process. So this particular graph is one function, uh, which is more or less big, receiving data from a mean port, one specific mean port. And we can see the typical pattern of, the, of this that looks like it's, we got like switch case statements that probably are uh, switching through uh, an opcode or something for the protocol. So one of the first issues, pre 34 it's um, again pre-auth uh, keyboard flow where the user has control of the size and the source and, 
and the destination buffer is, is the heap. But the problem that we have here is that um, to reach that particular MCBY, um, uh, we got to go to the to the case here in the switch case statement. Um, this function is going to be executed, get session by MAC. And what it's going to do this function is to check if uh, the MAC address that you have to send in your buffer it's uh, in a list of uh, authenticated MAC addresses. If it's not there, then you won't reach that particular MemCPY. So luckily, there is another case in the switch case statement where we can call this session alloc function where we can add our fake MAC address in, um, in that particular list. So first, we, we just need to, to execute this Python code where we will add this fake MAC address, uh, 41, 41, 41, 41, uh, to that particular list. And then after that, since our fake MAC address is in already there in that list, then we can set, we can reach that, uh, memcby, the heap overflow memcby. And here you can see in, in our buffer, in our buffer, we are providing the, the fake MAC address. And the rest is the protocol stuff to, to reach the, um, the memcby. And then here we have the, the crash of this MCPY, this uh, heap or flow, which uh, since we don't have uh, modern exploit mitigations and, and the libc version is all in this operating system, it shouldn't be too complex to get uh, code execution from this heap or flow. Then we got more heap overflows uh, like this one, uh, pretty much the same in another switch case statement, but basically it's exactly the same that uh, the source user control, size user control, and the destination is a heap buffer. Now, this is the, uh, the vulnerability that we, I will try to use in the demo. So it's a um, stack overflow through Mint as well. So it's another uh, memcpy wipe where the destination buffer is a stack buffer, obviously. And the size is also user controlled, but the, the size and the source comes from the heap buffer, and it's the heap buffer that we were discussing before with the heap overflow. So uh, the problem that we have here is that this is the memcpy that uh, for the stack overflow. So if we want to reach the return address in the, in the stack, our buffer has to be big enough to reach that. So the problem is, as the source comes from the heap, then we'll have to also overflow the, the heap buffer and also overflow the uh, next chunk and the next chunk's uh, metadata. And we could have problems with the libc sanity checks uh, because uh, if uh, if the sanity checks uh, uh, triggers here, then um, it, w it could crash the, the process and then uh, it, it could ruin uh, our exploit. But in this case, it's not going to be a problem because uh, in between there are no allocations on freeze, and so it won't it won't crash, and we will be able to to reach the the stack overflow after the uh, heap overflow. So for the exploit, as I said, we don't have modern ex exploit mitigations. So we could think, okay, we just need to, to jump to our circle and, and that's it. But no. Uh, uh, so if you guys are familiar with MIPS exploitation, there is a well-known problem. It's the cache incoherence problem. So we got uh, in MIPS CPU with two different caches, the instruction cache and the data cache. And normally our payload, uh, so our cell code, it, it, could be in the store, it could be stored in the data cache. So the problem is that when we try to jump to our cell code in the memory, if the, the cell code is still in the data cache and is not flashed, then we could end up uh, trying to execute another instructions that are in, in the memory. So what we just need to do is to fill the data cache and the um, one, one, one possibility is to fill uh, the data cache to flash it, but it depends on how big it is, this cache. Another option could be to um, call a blocking function, function such as sleep using ROP, and using ROP because we could think here like, okay, I'm gonna write a an, an small shell code which uh, calls sleep and that's it. But yeah, we, we, could, then, uh, we could have the, the same problem, like uh, the, that mini shell code could be still at the, um, the cache and then we will, we won't be able to reach uh, that. So that's why we're using Rob. Uh, and then after that, then the cache will be flashed and we can jump to, to our cell code. So for the, the Rob exploit, um, 
from the epilog of, of the function where we have the stack overflow, we can know what registers we have control with. So this is very useful for the for the route, obviously. And then this is the 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 gadgets that I'm using to to execute the slip and then jump to the shell code. And all of them are from the libc. For the shell code, I'm using uh, a standard reverse shell code. Uh, not a big deal, but um, I mean, there are on the internet we can find several uh, MIPS cell codes for Linux. Uh, even Metasploit provides uh, MIPS cell codes, but uh, and this particular one is from Exploit Database. But none of these are going to work in this system. And as far as I know, uh, and I tried to find cell codes uh, that could work in this system are not going to work. Um, and that's why mainly because this is uh, MIPS N32. So MIPS N32 has some particularities. For instance, it uses 64 bit registers but uses uh, 32 bit memory addresses. But also, what it has is different syscall codes. Oh, that's why the shell codes are not going to work. So it's not a big deal. You can just open the libc and check the syscall codes for each um APIs that your shell code is uh calling. For instance, this is the socket uh, function and this is the syscall code for this function. And then after that then you you got your MIPS N32 shell code that is gonna work, uh which by the way is big Indian. So for the exploit um yeah so remember that I'm using the uh the black access point uh as the attacker and it's going to attack the, the white uh, module access point that I have here. Um, so this graph represents better the, the exploit so you can understand better. And I'm gonna exploit it through, uh, a mint exploit through, through the Wi-Fi. So this is the attacker's laptop which is my Mac here. So I'm gonna connect through the Wi-Fi to the target access point that, uh, because the access point is providing a, a Wi-Fi obviously. Then I have an Ethernet cable connected to the attacker's device. And using the the internet sharing of, of macOS feature, then uh, now the attacker's device can connect has connectivity to the target through through the Wi-Fi. And then three basic steps: I'm gonna run the netcat listener in my, my in my uh, laptop. Then I'm gonna execute the mint exploit, with, which uh, will change three different things, as I will explain. And then through the Wi-Fi, it's going to exploit the mint vulnerability, and then the reverse shell it will connect back to to my listener. So let's see if it works. Fingers crossed. So I'm connected to this access point, Moto Test, which is the the, the target device. And here is the uh, the AP71319 FD80, which is my, the attacker's de uh, device. So, with this command, oh, nice, wait, wait a second, please. So, mint neighbors. Now we can see with this command that the mint link is already established between the, tar the attacker's device and the target. Then I'm gonna access to the to the root cell. So we have this uh, shell script which is gonna um, execute uh, three different Python scripts. The first one is the one that adds our fake MAC address in that particular list so we can reach the heap overflow. Then the second one is gonna trigger the heap overflow so we are gonna overflow the heap with our shell code and rub gadgets. And then finally we are gonna uh, execute or trigger the stack overflow which uh, that particular MCBY is gonna get from the heap buffer, the, the shell code and the rub gadgets. And also, I have here the netcat listener. So let's see if it works or not. There you go. So here we have the the, the reverse cell, and with uh, as a root, as you can see, and you can see here that this is the the AP seventy one thirty one. Uh, 36F3E0 device, which is the 
the target um, because the attacker was the uh, the 91 FD80. So yeah, so this is uh, the exploit for uh, one particular mint vulnerability uh, over the tier through the Wi-Fi. So uh, finally, as a conclusion, uh, so extreme networks were uh, really responsive to, to us and they uh, provided um, fixes and patches for uh, most of the, the issues. Um, here I, I'm sharing with you guys the link where you can check uh, uh, the patches and, and some other information. But at the beginning, apparently they, they didn't understand well the, the impact of the issues because also they were saying that uh, none of the vulnerabilities can be directly exploited over the air, which is not true, as you just uh, saw. Um, and some other stuff, like uh, for the mint vulnerabilities, they were saying that um, um, the attacker must have access to a wing device that has already been compromised. That's not true. I mean, I'm using my own device, so the attacker can use its own, his own device, but also uh, the attacker technically could uh, create his own mint client in his Linux box. So this is not a must. Um, but yeah, we recently uh, uh, spoke uh, with them and then they, they realized that it was wrong and they changed all this information and they are accepting now that uh, uh, the vulnerabilities can be exploited over the air and the, the attacker doesn't need to compromise a device to exploit the mint issues and some other, other stuff. So that's good. So, so yeah, uh, finally, I, yes, I think there is a lot of room, a room for improvement in, in this uh, operating system because uh, there are more vulnerabilities in, in this OS. Uh, so yeah, um, I know, uh, hopefully uh, with these lessons learned, they, they will fix in a proactive way uh, more issues and then we will have more uh, secure Wing OS devices uh, out there. So that's it, so thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I'll be around here.